Hi and welcome back to another video today, also another extreme overclocking video. Today we want to tune the i9-13900K with liquid nitrogen. We have an ASUS Apex board, which is still called Converge. It's still like a prototyping board and that seemed to be the prototyping name. We have two CPUs, one engineering sample, which was provided by ASUS as well. And we have the retail CPU, which was provided by Intel for launch. I think both of them are not pre-binned, so I wouldn't expect to achieve the same 8.8 .8 gigahertz as what Elmore had when he was doing the pre-testing with ASUS. I think they did heavy binning to achieve 8.8 .8 gigahertz. So that's the, the highest ever validated CPU. Congrats to Elmore for this. It's a very nice achievement. And yeah, I just want to get above 8 gigahertz and maybe do some other benches, Cinebench, whatever. We will see what kind of frequencies, what kind of scores we can get. At the time of shooting this video, the Apex board is not available for sale yet. At least in Germany, you could theoretically pre-order this at one shop where it's listed for 950 euro. And considering that it's a board that's lacking some features, I mean, it's tuned for overclocking obviously, but still you're missing like dim slots and whatever, but I'm not quite sure if the price point is a good idea. Visually, I'm also not quite sure. I mean, in the end, that's just personal preference if you like this like white silverish design or not. I personally would prefer a blackboard, but as I said before, that's just going to be personal preference. But pricing wise, it's just quite insane. We're using a nice gadget from Elmore again. He calls it the Hot 300. You just connect this to a six pin PCIe power connector and it's nothing else than just a PCB that's sitting behind those bluish, very thick thermal pads and it's going to heat the board from the back side, both on the CPU area and also extended here on the memory area. So that would go all the way to here. And ideally, because you would try to run full pot and in those conditions, it's very likely and very easy that ice builds up and we want to have as less ice as possible to just run the system as long as possible and that that should definitely help. For today's video we also received a different PSU. We're going to try the Be Quiet Dark Power Pro 12. It's a PSU I never tried before. For the CPU overclocking today it should not be that relevant because even if you go beyond 7 GHz like your 13900K is only going to pull like I don't know like 300 maybe 350 watt. But we're also going to try 4090 XOC and for you it's probably going to be like a week after. And for that it's definitely going to be quite relevant, by the way. Yeah, that happens when I'm uh, too lazy and I don't have something to put it underneath my mainboard. Yeah, I'm sorry. This is the uh, memory kit we're going to use, 7200C34, so those should be eight eyes. We saw some results already above 8000 mega transfers, so that should be quite exciting. I have no idea how this kit performs, so we'll have to test this. Stefan also joined us again for today's video. We are now on the mission to enter BIOS. It's, sometimes it's quite weird that you can hammer delete and Still, you cannot make it into BIOS. We just unplugged SATA so we can get in there to do the basics like flashing BIOS to the latest version that's recommended. It should be 0701, 0702, something like that. Then we will check the SP value of our 13900 case, of the retail and also of the engineering sample to, just to see which one should be better, just silicon quality wise. And then obviously it will also depend what kind of cold bug or any kind of like weird cold behavior we can see on the CPUs. That's still to be found and still to be tested. On our engineering sample CPU, we have a silicon prediction of 104. And split into detail, we would have the P cores with 113 and the E cores with 88. There is one thing we noticed about the Be Quiet PSU, not in a positive way though. And I already did the German take of what I'm saying right now and that's standby power. We switched off the PSU. That's like, like now I think it's already like two or three minutes ago, but standby power is still there. I think just the discharging the caps takes so long that it takes minutes and it's for like benching, it's just too long. The only thing you can do in this condition if you're benching is probably just plug in and out the 24 pin connector if you have to do a power cycle but that's not really convenient. For example, compared with an AX6100i from Corsair, 
you just switch it off and like one second later standby power is gone and now I think it's already three or four minutes. After waiting desperately for like five minutes I thought I mean that's just like something has to be wrong and then I pulled the plug and it's still switched off. Standby power is gone. Uh, Stefan can you assist? So if he puts back the plug and even if the switch is to like switched off I don't get it. What's the purpose of having like a main switch if it does not fully disable standby power? That is pretty weird. Like this directly disqualifies the Be Quiet PSU for benching. I don't, I don't get it. The retail CPU with an SP of 102 in detail 111 and 85 theoretically should be slightly worse. But Stefan pointed out that the VID values of the individual cores are just, they're just equal on the CPU. Whereas on the other CPU, the first one, we had different values like 1.418, 1.403 and then 1.388 and something like different values. And this is, seems like more even. That's why we'll probably stick to this one and try this one first for like all core OC and heavy multi-threading. Seven F. Why is it stuck at seven F? We were just stuck at the seven F postcode for I think like twenty minutes. I think it's related to the LN two mode. Whenever it's switched on, it's stuck there. It's not related to the VGA because you can see we switched to the forty ninety just to make sure this is not causing the problems. Same goes for the memory. Uh, tried like only one dim, but whenever LN two mode is enabled stuck at 7F. Not sure if it's due to some voltage that it's maybe pushed too high with the LN2 mode or if we just need lower temperature because that's theoretically possible. We're only at like minus 10 degrees Celsius. We were early at like minus 30 when we initially tried to boot but that's probably one more thing we can try. We will simply pour down a bit see if negative temperatures help like minus 100 like minus 120 then we should also be able to use the reserved switch and maybe both in combination will do the magic. Now with a temperature of way below minus 100, we'll try again and see what happens. Perfect. Perfect. So even with reserve switch enabled and way lower temperatures, just doesn't want to boot. Meanwhile, about one hour later, and we finally reached the stage of 55. Awesome. That means, I mean, we solved the 7F thing, but now like it doesn't detect the memory anymore or cannot boot with the memory. All the behavior we just experienced, it just didn't make any kind of sense after debugging. And I sent a message to Shamino on Facebook and I checked with him like, do you have any idea what's going on with like the 7F issue? And then like we have 55 now if he has any idea what's going on. And then he told me that this converge board, which is like an early Apex prototype, it has the switches placed in the wrong direction. That means that because I was wondering when I received the board, everything was like switched on and I obviously switched everything off because I thought, why would we use like slow mode and pause feature and everything out of like, like default? Yeah, I basically switched off any, everything. Like I was constantly using the slow mode, constantly using the, the pause mode and that explains everything. Now that we know that the switches were reversed, we're making some quite good progress. Just running like minus 150 right now, but you can see it's already above seven gigahertz. So we're definitely going in the correct direction and we can start fine tuning this system. We are just trying to find some maximum clocks right now, just all core on the P cores. Right now running 80 multiplier, which means that it's just above 8 gigahertz. Also increased the B clock to 101, so it's 8080 megahertz. 
Very easy, very straightforward. Just increased the voltage slightly to 1.7 volt, cooled all the way down to like minus 190. Increased the multiplier and seems like 80 is the max for whatever reason, like 81 didn't apply. That's why I'm just running with the B clock right now. But so far, very impressive. We will now try some multi-threading load with a Cinebench R20. The CPU is now set to 7.3 across the P cores. And as you can see, 5.8 across the 16 E cores. That should definitely help in multi-threading. Memory is like very loose. It's uh, 6800 C34, but we just want to max out the CPU first without running into memory issues. Cache is running at 6G. Even though nothing is maxed out just as a baseline, we're running about 2100 points. And to get an idea of the performance, a 64 core AMD Threadripper CPU, the 3990X, scores about 2300 points. So that's quite insane, I think, for a small desktop CPU. As you can see, it's 7.3 on P and 5.8 on E cores. For me personally, Raptor Lake is just extremely interesting and fascinating when it comes to raw clocks. And after the very quick and first attempt of hitting 8.0 GHz, I just wanted to try again to achieve max clock. Applying the same multiplier of 80 again was no problem. And with a slight increase in voltage to a total of 1.72 volt V core, 8.1 GHz were also possible quite easily. But from this point on, I decided that I would rather work with base clock first because it's a smaller increment, a smaller increase instead of going with a full multiplier, which equals basically 100 megahertz. Applying 100.5 megahertz B clock, in this case, a total of 8,141 megahertz was the max we could achieve on this CPU on this day. Unfortunately, I could not break my personal record, which is 8,337 megahertz, which I did back then with an AMD FX8350 CPU. But I also want to point out that today, when we tried the 3900K, we were overclocking all of the P cores, like all of the eight P cores, to 8,141 megahertz. Whereas when I tried it back then with the AMD CPU, it was just a single core clocked to 8.3 gigahertz. So that's definitely a difference. And I think if I spent more time and obviously a lot more liquid nitrogen on this CPU and trying to individual cores, we could definitely at least get 100 megahertz, maybe 200 megahertz more out of this CPU. But I will save that for a future video and also test more CPUs before doing that. As you probably also noticed in the screen captures, we were running the engineering sample CPUs to get the 8.1 GHz. When we tried the retail CPU, which had a more constant VID of about 1.4 volt, we noticed that it has a cold bug, which we could not get around. This meant that we could not go lower in temperature than about minus 180 degrees Celsius. Going lower would always shut down the CPU immediately. Whereas running the engineering sample, we could always go full pot. That means at least minus 190 degrees Celsius. And even though it's a small temperature difference, it makes a difference in clocks. It also seems like, at least after checking with other overclockers, that at least two thirds of the retail CPUs seem to have a cold bug. So even if you find a golden CPU under air, it does not guarantee golden clocks and also benchmark records under liquid nitrogen. Because you first have to check how it can handle lower temperatures and if it has a cold bug or not. This is very important, especially if you want to run high multi-threading loads, such as Cinebench. 5 to 10 degrees Celsius definitely make a huge difference there. We are pretty much at the end of our session. The CPU starts to behave worse clockwise, but I just want to perform a quick run to take a look at the power consumption. Clocked P cores to 7 GHz and E cores to 5.5. It was just enough to capture the power consumption during the Cinebench run and now the system is pretty much done. Just too long at like minus 200 degrees Celsius. We have a lot of condensation everywhere and at a certain point you just have to heat up, dry everything and try again. But just looking at the power consumption numbers, which we saw, it's interesting to see how close they actually are to ambient overclocking. Because a 3900K with ambient overclocking with good custom water cooling will easily draw like 340, 350 watts in R20. And we could see maybe 400 watt with liquid nitrogen overclocking. With the cooling, you're basically fighting the high power density. And even with this strong cooling, like minus 200 degrees Celsius, the temperature just raises so much in the core 
that at a certain point, if you go like, I don't know, 1.8 volt and like very high multi-threading load, the core will have positive temperatures and in the end will again hit a temperature limit. All right, I think now it's time for disassembly and like dry everything. It's getting quite late now and the day is about to end and we also decided to end our session. It was still a lot of fun even though we had those like small issues at the beginning where we didn't know that the switches were in the opposite direction. But once we figured that out, it is so straightforward. If you just use the Apex and you load the LN2 profile, you cool down to like minus 150 and also run the LN2 mode. It's pretty easy, I would say, to get to 8 GHz. Obviously, it's not the worst CPU. I don't think every CPU can do it, but most of them should get very close to 8 GHz. And I think running that across all of the P cores is pretty impressive. We will have another XOC video soon with the 4090 because we just received the 4090 XOC BIOS for the Strix, which means we don't have to do a power mod anymore. And that should be, that should be quite exciting. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time. Bye-bye.